Uh, greetings, everyone. Good day, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are on the globe. Uh, on behalf of Feed the Future and the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, I welcome you to our webinar, Planting New Seeds, Innovations in Global Seed Systems. I'm your host and friendly neighborhood senior knowledge management advisor, Zachary Bakke, with the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. I will facilitate today's webinar, so you will hear my voice periodically, especially during our question and answer period uh, later on. Before we dive into the content, let us take a moment to go over a few items to orient you to the webinar. First, please do use the chat box to introduce yourself, ask questions, and share resources with others. Peer-to-peer um, -peer learning is a key part of these events, and so we are excited to have a great crowd today um, to be able to share and you know exchange experiences. We will collect your questions from the chat box throughout the webinar. We will have our Q&A after the presenters have spoken. To enlarge your screen, if you find it uh, too small, you can click on the arrows in the upper right of your screen. This will make the presentation larger. Uh, you can click on the arrows again to shrink it back to normal. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and we'll email you uh, the recording transcript and additional resources once we have them ready. We will also post these on agrolinks.org on the event page uh, that you use to register. Um, thank you for your attention. Now onwards to our presentations and discussions for today's webinar, Planting New Seeds, Innovations in Global Seed Systems. Let me introduce Rob Bertram. Rob is the Chief Scientist in USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. He serves as a key advisor on a range of technical and program issues to advance global food security and nutrition. In this role, he leads USAID's evidence-based efforts to advance research, technology, and implementation in support of the U.S. government's Global Hunger and Food Security Initiative, Feed the Future. Rob will introduce the session and the speakers. I hand it over to you, Rob. Thank you, Zachary, and, and greetings, everyone. It's exciting to see all the names popping up, people all over the world, people who know uh, so much about this important topic we're going to be discussing. So welcome to everyone. Um, I'm just, I'm going to leave the details, of course, to the speakers, but I just want to say a few things before turning it over to them uh, about why this is so important. Uh, when we think about agricultural development and even development in general, the Green Revolution stands out. And of course, the Green Revolution was driven largely by huge leaps forward in crop productivity. Now, that wasn't all about genetics. It was also about information and water and fertilizer. But, but together, that was a, a history changing uh, event that continues to this day. And, and has uh, done so much to uh, promote uh, inclusive uh, economic growth well beyond the agricultural sector. And uh, for example, you know, crops represent about two thirds of the value in agriculture, uh, with animal agriculture being the other third. Um, they, but we know that, and such they, as such, they are a huge driver of productivity gains. <clears throat> and just last year, the World Bank. Uh, came out with a study called Harvesting Prosperity that shows that agriculture red growth is up to four times more effective at reducing extreme poverty. And, and, and the poorer the country, and the more effective it is. And of course, this is really important and significant for a, a, an agency like USAID in terms of trying to achieve outcomes embodied in the Global Food Security Act and feed the future around improving nutrition, reducing child stunting, reducing extreme poverty, doing so sustainably and in ways that enhance resilience. Um, the, the, I think the point when we talk about the Green Revolution, we think, oh, the 20th century. But what we're going to be talk, talking about today is more important than ever as we face the challenges of climate change, uh, uh, as we see emerging pests and diseases like fall armyworm, uh, positioning farmers in ways and, and food, whole food systems in ways to adapt to these challenges is absolutely critical. The last point is 
but we're living in a time of a blossoming of science where we're learning how to, to analyze genetic diversity and use and deploy it in ways that we couldn't even imagine just a few decades ago. But at the end of the day, if we don't have seeds that are getting into farmers' fields, none of this matters. And that's why the topic for today's seminar is so important. Seed systems are absolutely must have part of achieving the potential and the vision embodied in the Global Food Security Act, Sustainable Development Goals, and, 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 and looking towards a uh, climate adapted, uh, prosperous, peaceful world. So, with no further ado, I want to just briefly mention our speakers. First, we have Gary Allen from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Gary has been a longtime champion of uh, investment in crop improvement, both in the CGIAR system and uh, more recently at the foundation. We have Michael Quinn. Michael uh, leads the excellence in breeding platform of the CGIAR, which is spearheading work across the whole system to uh, uh, improve and modernize feeding approaches such that we can develop better products faster and, and see them uh, get to farmers' fields through functioning seed systems. Then we have Nora Lapita. Nora is the, the director of our work on input systems, and she leads our uh, community uh, research uh, community of practice here in the Bureau for Food Security. And she has been USAID's lead on crops to end hunger. Uh, and then finally, we have Simon Winter, who's the executive director of Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture. And uh, uh, Simon has, has been someone who's been on the translating end of technology, of science, in ways that meaningfully impact people's lives on the ground. So we're, it's just a terrific panel. Welcome to all of you. And Gary, over to you. Yeah, so, so, um, before I, I was with the Gates Foundation, I was, uh, a, a maize and rice breeder in the CG and a wheat breeder for a number of years with, uh, in Canada. Next slide, please. Um, the Gates Foundation, uh, invests in public crop improvement to, uh, alleviate poverty by increasing the yields of smallholders. Um, you know, basically because our, our theory of change is that, um, uh, um, productivity increases uh, lead to poverty alleviation and a, root, uh, a reduced environmental footprint for agriculture. And um, we're increasingly focused on uh, effective and constant adaptation to a changing climate uh, and intensifying cropping systems. And, and for, for plant breeding uh, and seed systems to, to uh, contribute to climate change adaptations, Farmers really need to replace varieties regularly to benefit from breeding investment. And so that's what uh, I'll, I'll focus on some of the issues, uh, both in breeding and, and uh, in the uh, systems and in the handover of breeding products to, uh, to seed systems that impede varietal replacement. <clears throat> um, in, in a number of areas in the, the uh, developing world, um, we face uh, uh, a, um, a stasis or a, 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 um, a blockage in varietal replacement that, you know, uh, some people refer to as the stalled green revolution. And I, I describe the situation in terms of, you know, first generation green revolution varieties really sold themselves uh, due to large invisible plant type differences uh, in the cereals induced by major dwarfing genes. And, and a second uh, cohort of Green Revolution varieties sold themselves to farmers uh, as, a, as a result of highly visible quality and disease resistance improvements in uh, issues that were, um, you know, uh, problematic in the first generation and relatively easy to fix. But those second, uh, um, oops. those second generation varieties uh, really, uh, in many places, got stuck in farmers' fields in the late 80s and 90s, and um, uh, uh, were really difficult to replace. All right, let's see if we can get this slide advanced. There we go. Um, and generally, 
There are two reasons you can think of why variety replacement might stall uh, or has stalled, and they're both true to some degree. Um, new varieties may uh, not be accepted because um, they're not sufficiently superior to old ones to induce farmers to adopt them. And in this case, it's a, really a problem with the breeding system. New varieties have to be both higher yielding and acceptable to the market and end-to-end -end users. And there is a lot of evidence that many breeding programs are not generating yield improvements um, that are, uh, um, uh, you know, really uh, large enough in uh, a... Uh, a market acceptable background to uh, induce farmers to, to switch. Um, the other, you know, p potential reason is that you know there's lots of new varieties that are that are available that are superior, but uh, state and, and private seed companies have no incentive to market them. Replacing varieties is really expensive uh, and time consuming, both for public and private companies. Uh, and in non-competitive markets, private sector producers really have very little incentive to uh, replace a variety that has good market share. Um, and government uh, seed uh, production organizations also need um, uh, incentives or support to, to invest in replacing an older variety with a newer one. And th one of the important um, criteria for making that replacement is really high quality information showing that it's worthwhile investing in the new variety, that it really is superior, is likely to be superior uh, by enough uh, in, in farmers, under farmers management in the future and in, in climates that are coming to uh, really warrant the investment. And we don't have uh, an on-farm testing system in most developing countries uh, now to uh, support that, um, uh, that decision. So, you know, Two basic reasons. Are the breeding programs delivering uh, high enough gains, or do we have uh, a lot of good varieties that are sitting on the shelf? Um, the, the, uh, these two areas are, are, are sort of encapsulated in key performance indicators or metrics um, I'm so, that the Gates Foundation uses for investment in crop uh, improvement in seed systems, and that have been... Um, really adopted by the Crops to End Hunger initiative uh, that uh, is, is now supporting uh, um, modernization of the uh, overall crop improvement system. And these are the rate of genetic gain uh, delivered in farmers' fields. This is typically measured on research stations, and there's, there's not much data to show rate of genetic gain on farms, especially in Africa, but uh, really in, in South Asia as well. Um, these rates of gain uh, range from uh, zero to one percent in most CG and national breeding programs, usually less than half uh, half a percent per year uh, on station when measured, and we really have no idea what they are on farm. Um, and the other, you know, uh, uh, metric that um, really uh, uh, indicates the effectiveness of the seed system and getting out new products is the average area weighted. Uh, age of varieties in farmers' fields. I think this was originally developed uh, in the early 90s by uh, Derek Byerly and Melinda Smale. Um, most varieties in farmers' fields we found uh, through, through DNA analysis and surveys of breeding programs and, and uh, are uh, in, in uh, South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa are over 15 years old uh, on average, usually much older, whereas in Western Europe and the U.S., um, uh, commercial varieties of uh, cereals, soy, and maize are typically less than, than four years old. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the the situation in the irrigated breeding, rice breeding program is, is quite typical. I don't mean to uh, particularly uh, pick on Erie here. Um, it's not very different in a number of other programs, although, you know, there's, there's a big variation in, in uh, the, the um, uh, range of gains that are being uh, delivered by programs. But when uh, measured in terms of improvement in breeding value uh, since the early 1960s, we see that there was a you know a pretty quick rate of of uh, improvement for the, uh, the first 10 years or so, and then things uh, slowed down substantially. This is work by Jessica Rutkowski showing an average uh, linearized rate of gain in um, additive genetic breeding value of about 13 kilos per hectare per year 
or about uh, 0.3 percent annually in that in that program. At the same time, they made good gains in uh, disease resistance and quality. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, you know, um, it's not that the program was in, uh, entirely ineffective, but it wasn't very effective at improving improving yield. Um, and the reason uh, we think that this was uh, the case was that um, this this uh, figure shows the uh, average length of a breeding cycle uh, turnover of uh, uh, a gener uh, you know a, a complete generation in that program uh, through obtained through pedigree analysis by Jessica Rutkowski and Josh Cobb. And the first three breeding cycles, uh, let me see if I can put a pointer on here. Um, the first three breeding cycles in the uh, uh, early uh, uh, 60s through the mid 70s were, were, were quite quickly completed. And then there was a really a very long cycle where there, a lot of uh, crossing back to the same parents uh, occurred for, uh, you know, something like uh, uh, 35 or 40 years. Um, and um, the uh, push on shortening the breeding cycle didn't uh, really start until the, uh, um, you know, in, in the last 10 years. And, and this has really uh, resulted in, in uh, higher rates of genetic gain from that program. Um, and this, this um, problem of... Um, uh, not paying enough attention to the length of the breeding cycle is pretty consistent across uh, uh, plant breeding programs, uh, public plant breeding programs uh, around the world. Um, it's really important to think of plant breeding as, uh, uh, as having uh, a cyclic population improvement component. I don't seem to be able to get a, a pointer. Oh, there we go. Okay. A cyclic population improvement component uh, and, and where you uh, uh, select uh, the best parents, intermate them, generate new lines, test them as quickly as you can, and then uh, from from um, you you introduce uh, through a, a trade pipeline um, new haplotypes or alleles for uh, uh, high value traits that don't exist in this elite breeding population, and every cycle or two you. Um, uh, uh, let's see if I can get the pointer back. You you draw off um, uh, commercial candidates uh, and um, get those uh, uh, tested, released, uh, and uh, into farmers' fields. And you try to um, uh, you try to uh, uh, have uh, market research information feeding back into the uh, feeding back into the um, the product profile or the product design that drives these breeding cycles. And, and it's really the length of that breeding cycle, that uh, this recurrent breeding cycle, that determines the, uh, the rate of genetic gain that a, uh, um, a breeding program will deliver. It's not this process of uh, extracting and, and uh, multi testing and multiplying up commercial products. Although that's, you know, that's critical to uh, getting, uh, getting the product into farmer's hands. And it, it um, sets up a, a pretty natural division of labor where you could have a, uh, a core centralized hub uh, um, managing improvement uh, of, a, of an elite population uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, um, testing and uh, variety dissemination organizations in the uh, uh, the. Um, in the target environment uh, uh, that are cl very close to the end users. Um, what are the key changes needed in the uh, international crop improvement system to accelerate varietal turnover, both from improved breeding and effectiveness standpoint and, and uh, helping with the handoff to the seed system? Um, the first one, which will be uh, uh, elaborated, I think, in more detail by uh, uh, Michael Quinn of the Excellence in Breeding uh, platform, is the use of carefully designed product profiles. Traditionally, breeders have been in charge of designing varieties in public sector breeding, but successful uh, private sector programs use um, uh, formal product profiles that, that are designed with the, the support of, of marketing teams, uh, in the case of CG programs, that would be uh, with the support of uh, social scientists to collect 
uh, market intelligence, preference information from end users, farmers, processors, uh, and and carefully incorporate the uh, um, knowledge of both uh, male and female farmers. Uh, and this uh, market intelligence is integrated with agronomic information, uh, you know, from the agricultural, uh, uh, the biological scientists into detailed descriptions of the trade thresholds that are needed for uh, commercial success. The job of the breeding team is to deliver varieties that conform to that product profile, uh, and and um, the uh, um, they use product profiles for selecting parents for the next breeding cycle and for product advancement uh, uh, from uh, each cycle for commercial release and, and deployment. And and um, the EIB, the Excellence in Breeding Platform, the Syngenta Foundation, are, are really supporting the uh, implementation of uh, a much stronger product profiles in the international crop improvement system. Um, the other, you know, in terms of breeding effectiveness, we need to uh, uh, help um, CGIAR and NARS breeding networks to uh, uh, accelerate and, and improve the accuracy of, of their breeding. Typically, uh, public sector breeding cycles are at least 10 years, often longer if you calculate them properly uh, from the pedigree. Um, and the plant breeder's error, uh, I call it, is really failure to separate the breeding process into those two components I showed you on the previous slide with a, a population improvement component and a, uh, a product extraction component. Only population improvement results in genetic gain. There are many new scientific opportunities to improve uh, population improvement. And um, the Excellence in Breeding Platform is uh, helping CG programs model uh, and uh, redesign their pipelines based on, on uh, quantitative operation uh, optimization. Um, genomic selection and speed breeding technology should allow breeding cycles to be reduced to three or even two years in many grain crops. Um, and we're one of the uh, important results of this type of analysis is that uh, small, fast breeding programs are really more effective than, than uh, large, slow ones. The final change that we need in the system is really uh, to improve on-farm testing at scale, particularly in Africa. It's a, it's a missing link in public sector breeding. Um, the, uh, uh, this is just an example of, uh, I'm using the, the name of, uh, the previous name of the company Corteva because that's when this work was done. Uh, when, when Corteva introduced uh, a new product line called Aquamax, they tested uh, the final selection candidates on about, I don't know, 3,000, 3,500 sites in the American Midwest for uh, uh, three years, uh, whereas the CIMIT um, maize breeding program in eastern and southern Africa uh, tests uh, on an average of about 40 on-farm trials a year. So we really need to step up on-farm testing. Uh, so that we're, we can be very sure when we recommend to a Ministry of Agriculture to a seed system that a, a new product uh, is uh, is going to perform better than what farmers are currently growing and justify investment in it. Um, just to make the case for uh, these um, uh, um, accelerated breeding systems, I'll try to do that with this rather difficult to read slide. I've got um, here for, se for uh, six breeding schemes the um, uh, genetic uh, gain in, in genetic standard deviations per cycle plotted against size of program. Um, this uh, um, uh, red arrow points to a, a scheme that tests F4 derived lines, advances two generations a year, uh, and does two, ge two years of, of uh, uh, yield testing before, um, uh, before uh, selecting parents. Um, the, uh, uh, this scheme, uh, I think it's in orange here, uh, it tests F4, uh, F4 derived lines, advances three generations a year and does one year of testing, cutting, uh, the breeding cycle in half. Uh, and, um, uh, at every population size, it doubles the rate of genetic gain. And an interesting feature of these faster programs is, uh, at a, a, a population size testing 100 entries, um, this faster program delivers a higher rate of genetic gain than the slower program, which is still a pretty aggressive program for a public sector breeding program, uh, um, 
with a uh, thousand entries. So much smaller programs uh, working much uh, much more effectively if they're fast. What will it take to help CG and national networks uh, achieve faster, more accurate breeding? Well, it'll take adoption of a population improvement mindset, implementation of uh, integrated breeding and genomics information management systems. Michael will talk more about that as well as about mechanization and digitization of population uh, management and field testing, adoption of rapid generation advanced systems permitting three and perhaps even four uh, generations of advanced per year in pure line crops, um, and genotyping of all selection candidates entering uh, replicated testing and, uh, to permit genomic selection. Um, the, this, this will cost uh, to implement these uh, uh, changes, but the, the, the capital costs of modernizing um, CG research facilities will be modest. I would estimate about three to five million per, per breeding network. And the annual operating costs may actually be reduced through mechanization and a switch to single seed descent rapid generation uh, advance. Um, uh, that's been the experience of Erie, which uh, introduced uh, formal product profiles, cut the breeding cycle to uh, four and is working on three years, uh, reduced, uh, adopted single seed descent, reducing line development costs by about 90%, outsourcing genotyping through the, with the support of the Excellence in Breeding Platform, increasing multi-environment testing, uh, and um, uh, centrally managing uh, uh, breeding operations that are uh, mechanized and digitized. Um, the, um, uh, you know, we, we need to think about how we're going to redesign CG NARS breeding networks for rapid cycle genomic assisted breeding. Uh, these, um, uh, you know, uh, networks are, are critical to the function of CG breeding, operate in different ways. Some of them are, are basically schemes for uh, testing um, products of CG programs. Others like Pavra are highly collaborative in terms of product profile design and advancement decisions. But they're also perfectly uh, situated to introduce rapid cycle uh, population improvement, uh, opening up new possibilities for CG uh, NARS breeding collaborations. Um, the uh, um, uh, these networks need to jointly design product profiles, select parents, and make advancement decisions, but the CG uh, programs have a, a really strong comparative advantage for uh, managing a rapid cycle genomic selection. Um, most phenotyping needs to be done at national program sites in the target population of environment at stage one uh, in the uh, agronomic testing step. I think in, I'm running over, so in the interest of time, I'll skip that slide and just jump to the conclusions. The um, varietal replacement is needed for climate change adaptation, but it's happening very slowly in, in most of Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Low rates of varietal replacement are due to poor product design, uh, low rates of genetic gain, and lack of uh, incentives for companies to replace varieties. Uh, genetic gains delivered by the CG and national partners have slowed since the late green revolution, often uh, due primarily to slow breeding cycles and a lack of emphasis on uh, uh, accuracy for quantitative traits. Delivering high rates of genetic gain will require CG breeding programs to adopt a population improvement focus. Breeding pipelines will need to be formally optimized for the rate of gain, uh, genetic gain delivered per year. Um, CG serial and legume programs should immediately aim for a three-year breeding cycle and transition to two-year cycles uh, as soon as they can, and which should be doable within five or six years. This will take modest investments in uh, uh, the facilities needed to advance three generations a year in, in most crops and uh, possibly four in controlled environments. Um, CG breeding networks need to be restructured so that product profiles are designed collaboratively. Stage one testing is done primarily at national partner sites in the target environment, and advancement decisions are made jointly. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks very much for that, Gary. That's a really nice, uh, really nice framing for what I'm wanting to present, and uh, and touches on many of the issues uh, that we're working on. So I'm wanting to give a so Gary, particularly at the beginning of his presentation, has, um, has really framed what the opportunities are, and, and I want to give a, a high-level description of, of what excellence in breeding, the areas in which excellence in breeding is working to, to address these opportunities. 
So if I start with the with the pipeline that uh, that pipeline to delivery, I mean just thinking of Gary's model, we've got the cyclical um, population improvement. You think of that as a genetic improvement. Then you go through to variety development, uh, seed systems, and ultimately delivery to farmers. So across this pipeline, if we think about why variety turnover is low, I mean, and Gary made these points. I mean, we we can have insufficient genetic gain. Uh, poor targeting, that is that um, the product profiles have not really been well set and they're not really necessarily set for, uh, for targeting uh, the replacement of varieties and, and being sufficiently market driven. Um, and, and then there's at the bottom there the, the delivery of the pipeline may not be 100% effective. So this is the same point Gary's making, I'm just trying to set the scene in terms of um, uh, trying to make the point of, of where where excellence in breeding is working. So uh, what, what does excellence in breeding do? I mean, well, we, we lead and catalyse change in, in CG and NARS breeding programs. And so we're really trying to, to move, the, uh, move, uh, move the ball in terms of uh, the current state of breeding programs and move them to, it, to being more effective in, in many of the ways that Gary has just described. And when I say that we, say that we provide the leadership, this is, more, this is in the sense of of um, defining targets and, and working with programs to 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 move towards that target in terms of how their their breeding program is structured again in, in the ways that, that Gary that describes and not not in the, the sense of uh, of line management. We provide expert advice and consultancy and uh, best practices, tools, technology, uh, access to shared services and, and training, and and we're also uh, through the Crops Den Hunger Initiative. Excellence in Breeding is managing um, funding from from the uh, the Cross and Hunger funders to to target improvements for, to, to achieve those uh, those upgrades that, that Gary just mentioned. So some of these areas are, are in scope for us, particularly the uh, the parts about um, targeting and uh, setting of product profiles and and increasing the rate of genetic gain. Uh, C systems is out of scope, but we do uh, work closely with the national programs, and so uh, we do have some influence in that space. So specifically um, uh, in that area, um, I mean, C systems, like I said, are out of scope for us, but um, we are promoting the, the CGIR NARS network uh, that, that Gary referred to, rather than, than separate programs. And these have the components that that there needs to be a, a greater sense of ownership of CG germplasm by, by NARS, by national programs, and by involving NARS more in product design and in final stage selection, NARS will have greater ownership of the final products and be much more likely to, to push variety turnover more, more aggressively. National programs lead final stage uh, variety selection based on their in-country needs and, and alignment with, with extension services. And extension services are often the major sources of, of varietal information and, and planting material for farmers in, in the target region. And NARS should, should be the bridge between CG research and, and those extension services. There, there should be a clear and, and differentiated roles between CG and NARS. CG should take... Um, I mean, moving forward, it's likely that CG will take greater responsibility for, for trade discovery, trade integration, and population improvement for, for broad market segments. And within this network, national programs should be responsible for product development or, or the, the variety development and late stage testing. Um, and and to varying extents, this, this model is already in place, but, but it's about strengthening these networks and, and having these clearly defined roles Within, within that network. Development of centralised breeding operations unit that, uh, that provide operation support to this CG NARS network is something that we're really uh, working strongly to, to, to emphasise and to strengthen. And, and going forward, uh, it would be great to see CG take on greater, um, be able to provide more and more um, Support to the to the operational side of, of that network. Many national programs have infrastructure in place. They've got they've got good breeders, 
but they really struggle for, for operational budgets. And, um, and so if, if this can increasingly be uh, coming from that network, that would be a, a really great thing. So moving on to improved targeting, um, the, uh, th this is the piece that the Gary is mentioning in terms of, of, of product profiles um, and, and defining market segments and being very clear about, uh, about who we're breeding for and making sure that all breeding decisions are, are starting with, with the end in mind and, and really looking to replace varieties so that we achieve that, that goal of, of driving down um, the, the age of varieties in farmers' fields. So Excellence and Breeding is working with CG and NAS breeding programs to, to characterise the market segments that they're breeding for. Um, and, and it's important to be very deliberate about targeting specific market segments with specific breeding pipelines. This means being very demand-led and starting with the end in mind, in this case, the end being the replacement of currently grown varieties. So it's important to be focused on the, on the traits and correct trait combinations required for the targeted market segments, and which is the product profile, which you're going to hear more about yet from, from Nora in the next uh, presentation. And having well-characterised market segments together with, with focused pipelines can result in a, in a pipeline investment case, uh, enabling prioritisation of, of limited investment funds and to ensure that investment funds are or that funding for breeding in, in, uh, across national programs in the CG is really, particularly in the CG, is really targeted to where it's going to have the, the most impact. And, and again, I, I think Nora is going to explain more about that. So in terms of how this looks different to um, what does this mean in terms of a difference, I mean, this means not having breeding pipelines that are extremely uh, trait-oriented in its own sense. It's really about trait packages and being very clear about what those packages are, and, and that's, that's the product profile. And that's the target of the breeding pipeline, is the, the, the product profile. There may still be trade integration pipelines, but they, they're deliberately servicing the, the cyclical population improvement process that, that Gary mentioned in, in his presentation. Move along here. So, so we've got a whole module working working in in, in that whole area um, within within excellence and breeding. So, what are the other areas in which we're working? So. From here, the rest of the presentation is about addressing accelerating the rate of genetic gain. And this is really about getting the fundamentals right with, uh, and then with the appropriate use of modern technologies and, uh, and approaches. So this, is, this means optimising breeding schemes with, with uh, applied quantitative genetics principles. And, and I'll go into each of these in, in just a little bit of detail, so I'll, I'll just run through these now quickly. It's about phenotyping, that's more accurate, lower cost, faster trials genotyping, data management, and, and biometrics. So if I look at each of those in, in, uh, in isolation, or, or just go into a little bit more detail into each of them. So we've got a whole module on, on optimised breeding schemes, and it's led by Eduardo Coverubius, you see his face there. And uh, these are some of, on the slide there, you see some of the examples of the, of the things that this, that this part of the excellence and breeding is really trying to address. So the first dot point there is shortening the, the breeding cycle times. And Gary made some really nice uh, uh, illustrations of, of how effective this is and using ERI as an example. So where this is a, a really important target for excellence and breeding. Um, using a selection index can, can support the, that to be successful. Um, optimising resource allocation, for example, replication within environments, uh, sampling versus sampling more environments versus the size of the program. How can you take a limited amount of resources and make sure that you're really optimising that rate of genetic gain by, by the decisions that you're making in these different areas. And that last dot point there is the use of genetic resources. More focus on elite by elite crosses and really um, ensuring that, that uh, germplasm is recycled and that means uh, making elite by elite crosses and then taking those progeny as quickly as possible and then putting them back into the pipeline rather than going back to um, older material or worse yet even um, wide sources of variation, perhaps from the gene bank. And, and uh, strategically and systematically bringing in new sources of high value germplasm in elite backgrounds. So this is about separating out the, the process and 
and that's what this next slide actually is about, separating out the process of um, trait discovery and trait uh, deployment from the population improvement piece. So there's a lot of detail here, and, and really I just want to say that um, the trait deployment side can be in the blue box on the left, and then population improvement is the, the middle box, uh, the red, the orange box. And by separating these out, and um, being uh, meaning that if you're trying to develop a variety, or, or at least the population improvement cyclical side uh, part that Gary described that variety spin off from, that should be entirely elite by elite. Moving along to, to phenotyping, this is really about, uh, this is another area which we're really focused on, and this is about more accurate, efficient trials and, and rapid turnover of data. So some of the examples are uh, consistent irrigation, soil management, agronomic practices, um, increased mechanisation and digitisation. I mean, that can make huge leaps forward in terms of accuracy and, and efficiency. Um, continuous improvement is something we're doing across all aspects, but uh, phenotyping is so process-oriented that it's a, a strong push in this, in this area. And, of course, health and safety. Um, we have a, a, whole, a focus on genotyping, and this is a really nice example of the, of the shared services that, um, that we're, we're looking to, to uh, provide access to, and, and I think Gary uh, mentioned this a little bit as well. Uh, so through extension of the high throughput genotyping project, excellence and breeding has, has aggregated demand across the system for genotyping so that we can drive down prices and negotiate lower cost genotyping and provide it in a standardised way, a, a centralized, in a centralised manner so that we're not having to, so each individual breeding team is not having to have their own marker lab. And this means that we've got uh, forward markers for around $2 per sample and mid-density uh, genotyping for genomic selection and genomic uh, applications for around $10 per sample. Um, data management is super important. Uh, so the utilisation of new breeding tools that I've been describing, uh, such as genotyping and improved biometrics, are, are entirely dependent on the breeding team's ability to manage very large and complex data sets and bring them together into a single analysis. So Ocean's and Breeding is developing a, a data management system purpose-built for breeding called the Enterprise Breeding System. We'll work closely with CG and NARS breeding teams to support adoption of this system, but, but also other systems that, that, that are available and that might be more appropriate for them. So the, the goal here is to have, have all programs on a, um, a professional and purpose-built data management system. And this is my last slide. Um, the last area that we've got a, real, a strong push on is in biometrics. And this is one of the cheapest ways to increase accuracy and drive better decisions. And integrating with purpose-built data management systems, like I just mentioned, uh, lowers the cost of entry for the current best practice trial design and, and analytics. So with that, I, I am aware that uh, the time is moving along, and so um, I'll now hand it over to Nora. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Greetings, everyone. It's really great to see everyone who joined us today. I'll describe a multi-donor initiative called Crust and Hunger. And Gary and Michael already described elements of this initiative, including modernizing CGIAR breeding programs and strengthening partnerships between the CGIAR and NARS. My talk will focus on how the initiative prioritizes investments to achieve the greatest impact on poverty and hunger reduction. And I'll touch upon linking breeding with seed delivery. So the Crops to End Hunger is funded by five uh, major donors to the CGIAR. And our shared vision is strengthened CGIAR crop breeding programs that develop and deliver more resilient, more productive, resilient, and nutritious varieties of staple crops in demand by smallholder farmers and consumers in various geographic regions of the developing world. So to achieve the greatest impact on poverty and hunger reduction of the most food insecure populations of the world, 
we prioritize our efforts on crops and geographies that have the highest potential impact on poverty and hunger reduction. To do this, USAID commissioned a study with IFPRI and USDA ERS to estimate impacts of faster productivity on income and other indicators in developing countries in 2030. So I will present the results for the parity model, which was used to determine allocation of crops and hunger resources. The parity model is often used to decide allocation of research resources among multi multi-commodity systems based on gross value production of each commodity. So the model considered how investments in crop productivity improvements can benefit smallholder farmers from higher growth sales. The study included the 20 food crops where the CGIAR does breeding. It focused on five geographic um, regions, Sub-Saharan Africa, South and Southeast Asia, West Asia, North Africa, Central Asia, and Latin America. So the model assumed that each crop sustains a yield growth of 25% over the baseline yield growth. So if baseline yield growth is 1%, then enhanced yield growth would be 1.25% per year. To estimate growth value production in 2030, they use IFPRI's impact model. And the modelers also applied weighting schemes to give higher weight to populations that are or below the poverty rate of $1.90 per day. The results are shown in this slide. So based on total value production, which is, um, here we're looking at it and in this, this first graph, more than half come from cereals with rice, maize, and wheat taking the major share. About a third come from roots, tubers, bananas, or RTB, and um, oil seeds and pulses make up about 10%. But when you weigh the growth value by poor households accruing benefits from each crop, we find that the importance of RTBs jumps up and the oil seeds and pulses increase as well, while cereals decrease. And when considered, and when weighted by the depth of poverty, also called poverty gap, which considers the extreme poor, the importance of cereals falls even more, and the importance of RTBs increase. So this results reflect the importance of cassava, yam, cowpea, and groundnut for poorer consumers and countries. Our allocation of resources was further refined by considering the importance of different crops by region and nutrition indicators. You'll see from this table that crops vary in importance by region. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, cassava and yams dominate, followed by maize. In South Asia, the largest uh, values are for rice and wheat, followed by potato. While in Southeast Asia, rice dominates by far, followed by cassava, and in Wana CA, wheat and potato, in La, maize, and banana, followed by rice. So using this information, crops were ranked in importance by region. Although not shown, the study considered hunger and nutrient indicators to further refine crop rankings. The modelers looked at the number of undernourished children and the population of, at risk of hunger in the selected countries in 2030. And th when this was done, crop rankings changed uh, slightly with rice and wheat ranking the highest in reduction of populations at risk of hunger. Another factor used to prioritize donor investments is target product profile. So, um, Michael already um, described what this is, and so what this, what target product profiles requires is, um, in designing product profiles, is defining a market segment to breed for. Then it requires an understanding of market demands within a market segment, which means collecting input from all possible stakeholders, from growers, the processors, consumers, 
as well as socioeconomists. The leading variety to be replaced would need to be identified. Target product profiles are often reviewed to remain relevant and aligned with changes in market demand. So putting it all together, prioritization of investments in crops and hunger considers crop by region refined by nutrition outcomes and product profiles as the unit of investment. Market-driven product profiles are um, service contracts between breeders and funders for accountability. And this is uh, development of product profiles and pipelines are backed by well-designed breeding programs accompanied by well-designed testing and delivery. So while seed delivery is outside the scope of excellence in breeding, as Michael um, pointed out, it's a critical piece in achieving the crop to end hunger's goal of replacing varieties in farmers' fields with improved and adapted varieties. Later, Rob will present a plan to link crop to end hunger generated products with seed systems. So this next slide shows USAID's framework for our crop improvement and seed delivery investments. The different types of activities are, in, are informed by product profiles at the outset. And the different activities are integrated with feedback and forward loops informing other stages to ensure that products develop meet target product profiles and have a pathway for commercialization and dissemination. These various activities are carried out by different partners who bring unique comparative advantages. So for example, we take advantage of the advanced capacities of uh, US universities through innovation labs and they they bring cutting edge technologies in the development of new tools, methods and technologies, and the discovery of new traits or new markers. For scaling and commercialization, we rely on public partnerships as one um, example. The coordination of activities among different implementing partners could be very challenging for a funder like USAID. So just, let's just look at Peanut. We, we have a Peanut Innovation Lab. We also invest in Acresat and we have separate investments in scaling and commercialization. These activities are often uncoordinated, and consequently, promising products and innovations in the pipeline can end up on the shelf for a number of reasons, including high cost of a product, unclear value, lack of market demand, and absence of networks with scaling and commercialization partners. So as a way to address this challenge, USAID is adapting the use of product life cycles, which the private sector uses effectively to track the progress of innovation, make decisions on advancement, and put plans in place for commercialization and dissemination. So my last slide shows um, USAID's pro product life cycle decision making framework. This framework shows the various stages of product development from initial design of a product profile, research, development, commercialization, adoption, and phase out of a product. And it's meant to capture the various investments that USAID makes and where our implementing partners contribute in the different um, stages of the framework. The framework has 11 stages which are shown in blue arrows and the expected outcome for each stage in orange boxes. We recognize that many of the stages are cyclical and require feedback and forward loops. And, um, but for the sake of simplicity, the stages are shown as linear. By defining the stages and outcomes, we are creating a common language that we and our partners and other stakeholders can share. The framework provides a standardized process to understand project status across multiple actors, including USAID stakeholders. It's also a decision-making tool for advancement of products from one stage to the next. The traffic lights between each stage indicates 
that predefined criteria have to be met before moving from one stage to the next. By using this framework to track the progress of our various projects, we would know what promising products are in the pipeline. This would allow us to plan in advance ways for uptake of research pro products once they are ready, for example, by creating institutional arrangements or strategic alliances between researchers and mission implementing partners or the private sector. We will engage the community in the near future to get feedback on how this framework can advance our collective efforts in designing demand-driven innovations and taking them to scale through commercialization or through public sector partnerships. So finally, to close, I want to highlight the importance of everyone, donors, implementing partners, and stakeholders working together to achieve reduction of hunger, poverty, and malnutrition. I have described a few ways to ensure that products developed from crop improvement investments reach impact. One is through clear targets of crops and product profiles. And where breeding stops, we need to ensure that there is a pathway for commercialization and dissemination of those var varieties vetted through the product life cycle. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to hand it over to Simon. Thanks, Nora. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so at Syngenta Foundation, we kind of take over and complement a lot of what you just heard about from Nora um, on the commercialization uh, part of the journey. And um, we are, in fact, a public-private partner of uh, USAID and, and a number of other organizations uh, in this process. So my talk today is just going to give you a brief snapshot of, you know, that kind of uh, gap that sits not just in seeds, but in many areas of uh, moving research and innovation into use in uh, farmers' fields and how we uh, at Syngenta Foundation uh, are playing a small role in trying to bridge that gap uh, and make that gap bridging uh, professionalized and uh, documented and data-driven so that it's not uh, a happenstance um, exercise, but it's something that can be systematized by many actors uh, and capacity can be built to uh, do that systematization and uh, then massively, we hope, expand the flow of uh, new seed varieties and other types of innovations then into use uh, in low-income farmers' fields um, in the future. So uh, how does that look when we look at this product life cycle that um, Nora was just laying out? Um, so the gray uh, boxes are the partnerships that we have, and I'm not going to go through every single one, but PASTA, which sits right in the middle under Seeds to be Africa, uh, is our partnership with USAID. Um, uh, that's the one down here. Um, and uh, we also work right up in the beginning of the breeding process uh, on something called demand-led breeding over here, uh, which is a partnership with the Australian uh, Council for International Agricultural Research and the Crawford Fund in Australia, where we're helping uh, on the front end to make sure that uh, new breeds are uh, being designed for uh, use, uh, for demand, as the name uh, implies. Not necessarily markets, because many Farmers uh, are not necessarily marketing the seed uh, uh, or products that they grow from seeds, they're consuming them on their farms. Uh, but that notion of designing for consumers um, is a very important part of the product profiling then that you heard about earlier uh, from uh, other speakers. Uh, our core work, though, is in this middle area uh, of this uh, transition from uh, the research from the breeding phase uh, into the commercial hands of seed companies. And that requires uh, a lot of work with NARS, uh, whether those uh, seed varieties are coming out of the CG system or whether they're coming out of USAID supported or other supported innovation labs or universities and so on. Um, we also have partnerships with the Gates Foundation uh, and ICRISAD. This uh, visa program is really focused on building the cap capabilities and capacity uh, of organizations to do that. And then we're also working over here with AGRA on Seeds for Impact uh, through the African Enterprise Challenge Fund, 
where we're then working with seed companies to make sure that they have the systems and capabilities in place to actually uh, produce and market and distribute these uh, input seed varieties. So uh, that just gives you a quick snapshot of uh, where we're working across the system. Um, and what we're doing uh, right now is we're taking all the kind of, uh, let's say, tools and knowledge that we've been learning and developing what we're calling at the moment, for want of a better term, a handbook, um, but it's not going to be a, a published handbook that sort of is done once and sits in a library somewhere. It's going to be a dynamic, interactive uh, set of tools uh, that can then be used uh, in order to have lots of organizations be able to do this uh, translation process uh, from uh, research into use that I've been talking about. Um, and we're working on this not on our own, but we're working in partnership with organizations like AGRA, like this Cross to End Hunger uh, group uh, and the delivery group that's been established under Cross to End Hunger and so on, uh, building off best practices that come from industry, uh, from large seed companies, uh, as well as from the research community, and uh, will then be used, hopefully in the future, to guide a lot more capacity building uh, than you know, anything that uh, any of the individual organizations represented on this call uh, can do on their own. Um, in order to do this, we really need to understand the complexity of all the steps that are uh, in, involved in this complex uh, interwoven set of processes that go from uh, late development um, of uh, breeds that are working technically but not necessarily growing as, in farmers' fields, even in trials, to the trialing phase uh, having those trials then um, uh, be introduced through uh, the NARS and through seed regulators uh, to be released um, and put into the market, put into the hands of seed companies, and then uh, the business model is taken on by the seed companies in the growth sector to be able to actually produce uh, the seeds commercially. One of the most critical things is what we call the product advancement mechanism, or PAM, and how this uh, process of translation gets managed by all the different stakeholders who need to be part of this and how it gets governed uh, in a way that is transparent and results in the best varieties, best performing varieties uh, being released and adopted um, while others uh, perhaps are not uh, and then uh, handed off uh, into the uh, seed companies in the market. And as Nora said, this is not, although it's presented this way as a linear process, this is not a purely linear process. There's lots of data and lots of knowledge that gets generated in all of this work that then flows back into the, the breeding stages. Um, and the aspiration, as I said, of this uh, handbook that we're working on is to have a more standardized process that covers all of these modules uh, that can be used by uh, all interested stakeholders. Um, just to go into slightly more detail in the kind of data that need is required at each of these traffic light driven stages that we're talking about here, uh, we have at each of those stages then a variety review. And at each stage, the variety review data is slightly different. It's uh, evolving as we go through these different stages from late development to the, the commercialization stage. And my um, uh, next slide shows you just one example of how this data gets used uh, to understand, you know, how are the new varieties being compared with uh, a product profile. Uh, so uh, you have a product profile here that is shown in blue, uh, which is the, um, you know, the ideal uh, performance that we're looking for. And then you can see how um, a new variety here, HCIP206, this is a potato variety, uh, is uh, matching up to an existing variety in use, Atlantic. Uh, and you can see that on multiple dimensions, the new variety uh, is performing better. It has much higher yield. Uh, it has um, much better sugar content. It chips better uh, and is better for French fries. And down here in the diseases category, uh, you can see it's resistant to late blight as well, uh, which the existing variety is not. So uh, this kind of systematic assessment process and looking at the relative performance uh, is absolutely critical. Uh, and my last slide just shows you how we think about this uh, oops, too many slides click through, uh, coming into a data, as we call it, a dataverse. And this dataverse gathers all of this uh, data. We've developed a field trial app, which is a, a mobile uh, app that can be used on a tablet or a smartphone, 
captures all the data from all of these trials and can then very quickly be examined from a benchmarking perspective as well as presenting that data in the right way for regulators or for seed companies uh, to be able to use it to make their assessments about releases and about uh, taking on these seeds for commercial production. And then we also look at the impact of all of this um, and look at you know how do these new varieties uh, perform in terms of farmer adoption, in terms of business adoption, uh, and not just in terms of numbers, but also in terms of value uh, as well. And there's lots more data uh, that's captured in these two models, but these are the headline key performance indicators that we're looking at uh, at Syngenta Foundation as we try and prioritize the kind of work we're doing and the focus uh, that we have. Um, so uh, hopefully that gives you a little bit of an indication of uh, both some of the complexities, but also the fact that there are tools in development um, that you know, can help to address those complexities. And all of this is going to be uh, available for uh, public use. And uh, back to uh, Rob. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simon, and all the speakers for a great set of presentations. I think they all hung together. I just want to make a few brief comments as we're running late, and I know we want to have a Q&A period. Um, just to say that I think it's really welcome to see the fact that the whole community, including the donors, are recognizing that investment in crop improvement needs to go hand in hand with investment in seed systems. Too often those things have been separated. We're really bringing them together here. It all hangs together. If you, if you thought about each presentation, you could almost line them up in sort of a, with, a, with an arrow connecting the beginning with the end and then coming back again. And I think that reflects the fact that how the emphasis on the user community, consumers, social science, uh, trying to really develop a product orientation that the private sector does very well, but we in the public sector have often struggled with. Uh, so this, uh, the, 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 the product profile uh, uh, discussion is, is really critical. The feedback loop, the fact that this has got to be data driven all the way through, both in the science end, but also very much, as, as Simon just pointed out, in the user end, in terms of what the market's demanding. Um, I want to make just a very, and then and the other piece is the, the fact that we're going beyond the, the, the CGIR to the user community in all its forms, uh, and I, I think this is all going to be captured in a white paper that's under development, so we're all going to have a chance to, to see how this is coming together through this delivery group, and Ian Barker at SIP is spearheading that, and we're really grateful to him for that effort. Um, Two last comments. Uh, we had a, re a recent presentation from Pabra about yellow beans in East Africa, and it was astonishing to see the speed with which new varieties were moving through informal systems to, to farmers really fast, and this was done using DNA fingerprint. So my point here is that nothing what we're talking about here is in any way at odds with the fact that informal seed systems continue to thrive. Uh, you know, we, we're going to take advantages of all the opportunities out there, uh, both the formal systems and informal systems, and, and of course they connect very uh, robustly. And finally, just to, for all of us in the ag and food communities to keep in view that what we do is absolutely essential to environmental outcomes on the global scale. We have to use the land we already farm as sustainably and productively as possible in ways that prevent the encroachment into forests and wetlands, the loss of biodiversity, and the climate, negative climate impacts that go with those. So this is all, when we step back and look at this as a global issue, this is as compelling in environmental terms as it is in some of the human outcomes that, that all the speakers have discussed. So I'm going to turn it now to my colleague, Zachary Bakke, who's going to handle the question and answer period. Thanks to all the speakers, and we really look forward to seeing the white paper Thank you, Rob, and thank you also to the speakers as well, uh, Gary, Michael, Nora, and Simon. Really appreciate uh, your presentations today and uh, jumping into the chat box and having a really rich discussion with uh, those participants today. Um, I would just take a moment to, again, apologize uh, for some of our technical difficulties, um, for you that had issues joining, we really appreciate your, you know, commitment to, to participating in this and um, powering through to, to join the conversation. 
Um, we are taking your comments seriously and we're going to look at ways to uh, improve your experience. So again, thank you for your uh, patience and um, your continued um, participation. Uh, with that, uh, I will start with the question um, that we've had submitted uh, from Jose uh, Gomez. Uh, how do you measure progress of varieties being released? Uh, is your indicator global or by country? Uh, I think that uh, would be directed to Gary, but um, perhaps others might have comments too. Sorry, uh, progress of varieties being released. I, you, that's really um, an issue to be addressed market by market, country by country. Uh, it's very important to understand that, that you know, that, that breeding programs have a clear target in terms of uh, um, a, uh, a cropping system, a population of farmers, and that they measure their progress in terms of the uh, productivity gains, income gains, poverty alleviation gains that they provide uh, in that target, not at some sort of theoretical global level. Thank you, Gary. Uh, we had a comment from Louise Sperling on uh, the formal seed system. Uh, at this point, data show uh, that the formal seed system provides 3% of the seed um, smallholders sow, and much of that is maize and some vegetable seed. It might be useful to look at other seed source options if uh, – high impact is to be reached for a range of crops. Um, kind of perhaps rewording the question or, you know, I invite Louise to, you know, add uh, a question to the chat box. Um, perhaps it's along the lines of, are there other options to help smallholder farmers access improved seeds given they are not successful accessing the formal sector such as a seed company? Um, but, well, are there other options? Uh, is there any comments from the presenters? If not, we can wait and see if Louise has. Yeah, uh, uh, this is Simon Louise. Let me just uh, sure. in with a quick comment there. Um, I think that um, there are many uh, different pathways for seed production. Um, you know, from uh, cooperative-based, more informal uh, type seed production networks to you know, large growing seed companies uh, producing seeds. I, I think we want to uplift the entire system uh, and, you know, finding the right pathway into the market uh, is part of what needs to happen in this commercialization process. It's, there, there shouldn't be an assumption that uh, necessarily we have to have, you know, very formally established companies be the only uh, seed producers. But at the same time, uh, you know, we also need to make sure that the capabilities are there, that the business model is there. Uh, and one thing that we didn't talk about too much earlier in the call is, of course, seeds are only one part of a production system on farm. Uh, you know, we need good agronomy. Uh, we need complementary inputs. Uh, you know, we need a good business case for the farmer to be producing uh, whatever they're producing um, uh, and so on. So, it's, it, you know, it's bringing all of those together on the delivery end that's important, not just making sure there's a direct pathway between the breeders. And Thank you, Simon. Could I make one quick comment on that, uh, on that question? Um, in, in terms of it f serving informal seed systems, I think the, the issue for breeding organizations uh, and and uh, ex extension systems, people who want to, to get um, new varieties to farmers, is to move the, the formal informal interface as close to farmers as possible. Uh, so, uh, you know, a, a, a deep understanding of those informal systems is required to, so that you can, first of all, make sure that your products are attractive and will move quickly uh, farmer to farmer as those bean varieties that Rob referenced did. And secondly, so that you can get, um, uh, you know, uh, small quantities of, of uh, uh, seed uh, to initiate that process into, um, uh, into the hands of uh, influential, informal uh, sector actors uh, as, as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you. Um, and an interesting, perhaps, follow-up question on that comes from Stephen Walsh, and it's, uh, is there any role in seed delivery for an entity that is not a seed company? Uh, I know you had mentioned um, the informal sector versus formal, um, so thoughts on that? If nobody else does. I mean, there's a huge uh, role for 
uh, both, you know, for many organizations that are doing community development work at village level in disseminating varieties, they, they uh, do a, a terrific job of it in, uh, in many contexts. Um, na uh, national seed companies as well. Okay. Thanks. Anyone else? If not, we can go to um, the next one uh, from Lawrence Kent. In Africa, uh, is the primary problem the fact that farmers are sowing seeds of older released varieties, or is the primary problem the fact that farmers are sowing seeds that do not emanate from breeding programs at all uh, and land acres? Uh, it could the problem be a simple lack of reliable access to seeds of improved varieties? Anyone? Um, yeah, I think it's a combination of both. It really varies from country to country. We have some countries where the, let's say, the formal seed system has been uh, much more successful and is much more developed. Um, Zimbabwe uh, being one example. Kenya, you could say, in maize is another. Um, uh, so in those, um, uh, you know, those formal uh, improved varieties tend to dominate. Uh, but then in other uh, countries, Malawi, for example, uh, land races exist in much larger uh, numbers. Um, and the challenge is, uh, from our perspective, uh, it's a combination of both lack of access uh, to uh, improved varieties um, which is sort of caught in a catch-22 then with a lack of a good business case for seed producers to start to produce the more improved uh, and advanced varieties. Um, so you have to kind of see the market start to develop to believe that you should be investing in seed production in a commercial way. And again, back to the informal point, whether you're a cooperative, uh, you know, distributing just to your community or you're, you know, a much larger, have much larger growth aspirations. But if you don't believe there's that market opportunity there, you're not going to invest. So, uh, we have to, you know, remove that catch 22 through the kinds of things we're talking about. Thank you. Any other comments? If not, um, to another point, uh, there was a very rich discussion in the chat box around, uh, counterfeiting, uh, David Spielman had put in, you know, a lot of, of the storylines around counterfeiting need to uh, disentangle malfeasance by seed producers, retailers from other causes of poor quality seed, e.g. less intentional mistakes like poor maintenance, breeding, um, multiplication, uh, storage, handling, etc. cetera. Uh, what are some of the, the, what are the speaker's thoughts on um, counterfeiting or the issues around it? And um, as noted by another speaker, you know, counterfeiting has emerged as an issue for maize and veg seed, vegetable seed. Are there instances of counterfeit seed on a regular basis for other crops? I'm happy to uh, take a crack at this, although I don't want to be the only one who <laughs> Gary to the question. Uh, but I think from our perspective, uh, it, it, again, it's market specific. There are some markets where counterfeiting is more of an issue, um, but it's certainly not considered such a inhibition that it's a barrier for formal seed companies in general to be investing. And many countries have now introduced measures to mitigate counterfeiting. Kenya, for example, has a mandate for a label on the seed package that farmers can scratch, send an SMS for a validation of the authenticity of their seed. And we think those kinds of uh, tools could be you know, relatively easily spread across uh, many countries. Um, thank you. Thoughts by uh, others on the other speakers? If not, uh, we have a question from Margaret McEwen. Uh, what do male and female seed users consider when thinking about buying seed? Is it only the tra traits or other conditions influence, influencing their decisions? If no one has comments on that one, I can go to another question. Just very quickly, uh, there, there's excellent work being done uh, by um, several organizations. Uh, what, the, what I know about is, is Simmet's work on um, women's access to hybrid maize seed. Uh, you know, we, when the Gates Foundation is designing uh, investments in breeding and seed systems, uh, we, we're really trying to uh, ensure that our, our partners um, 
design, you know, uh, uh, analyze uh, women's access to, to improved varieties and design um, uh, programming that will help improve that access because there's no doubt that they, uh, that, that women, the access of women's farmers to uh, improved products is, is uh, less than, uh, than uh, for male farmers. Um, but um, the CIMIT uh, uh, social science group is uh, doing some good work on, on in this area. Um, I believe uh, there are other groups as well. The, uh, um, uh, the, the Crop Improvement Innovation Lab uh, has expertise in this area, I believe. The, the USAID funded uh, investment. Thank you. Um, uh, there is a question from uh, Sereni uh, Rajendran. Uh, how do I ensure that farmers pay for quality seed when there are less commercialization uh, of the crop in the market and free distribution of seed through various NGOs, et cetera? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, uh, again, you know, as, as with most things, it's going to be uh, crop and market specific, but certainly if we're trying to, um, you know, move to a more modern uh, seed system, uh, and more professional seed system, uh, we have to have a level playing field uh, for uh, commercialization. Um, and you know, if there are certain organizations that are you know, handing out free seeds, um, it's going to be a very hard case for uh, farmers to say, well, I, you know, I want to uh, go and buy these other seeds, unless there's a clear performance difference uh, between the seeds and at the end of the day, the farmers can make more money out of the uh, the seeds they're spending money on than the uh, the free ones. But in low income communities, in times of stress, you know, free. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Mustafa uh, Mustafa Yazir, uh from. Uh, uh, Ramon from Bangladesh, who asks, you know, my major and most important question is, why does most of the seed seed businesses fall down or face losses in their business? Or the thoughts on the challenges of having a seed business? Any last thoughts on this question? Very tough business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I agree. I mean, from, you know, it, 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 we, in our Seeds for Impact program partnership with uh, AGRA and um, the African Enterprise Challenge Fund, you know, we're looking at trying to help these seed companies that maybe have come out of uh, initiatives like, uh, you know, AGRA's uh, uh, seed initiative that was uh, previously supported by the Gates Foundation that led to the creation of, you know, uh, 107, I think, seed companies. Um, in Africa, uh, you know, getting these seed companies uh, to be, you know, fully commercially reliant and be able to raise their own financing and their own capital and so on. Uh, and because it's such a tough business, most investors and financiers tend to be a little bit shy of working with seed companies. So, uh, again, we have to, you know, overcome this chicken and egg problem, uh, really prove that there is a commercial pathway forward for this sector and then we can persuade uh, more investors, more entrepreneurs, and more um, uh, financiers and so on that this is a sector worthy of support. But we're, we're in a kind of uh, a, a bit of a lacuna at the moment where we're still trying to find those evidences, I think. Great topic for your next session. <laughs> yes. Well, again, thank you, everyone, for your participation today. Thank you again for your, your patience. The recording of this session, the transcripts uh, from today's session, and the, the chat box discussion will all be made available and sent out to everyone who had registered for the event. We will also post them up on AgriLinks on the event page. Again, thank you for um, staying with us, um, participating, and for providing for such a rich discussion. And thanks again to our speakers, uh, Gary, Michael, Nora, and Simon, for providing us with such uh, great points to discuss. Uh, with that, I thank you and send you on to hopefully a great rest of your day or hopefully a good night's sleep, depending on where you are. Uh, thank you very much, and we appreciate your participation. 
Sorry, before everyone goes, uh, one last bit. Um, please take a moment to fill out the polls uh, and provide suggestions for our webinars in the future. We um, really appreciate your feedback. Uh, if you want, the slide deck can be downloaded on the file download pods to the left.